Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. I want to talk to you about, about the compassion of Jesus Christ. I want to encourage you that tonight as we continue to celebrate, and we're celebrating Christmas, why? Right? The, the birth of our Savior. And as I was thinking um, about our, our celebration and our Christmas services, and sometimes we get caught up with, with the to-do things. We have to, there's so many things that are going to be, to be taking place. We're going to have, we're gonna have a skit with the kids. We're going to have a great performance. And, and it's, it's, it's amazing. And, and it's, oh, well, because we should be doing that. But I don't want you to forget why we do what we do. And what we do what we do is because I believe that we have an opportunity in this season to reach out those who are broken. I came to Jesus uh, 22 years. Actually, today is the 12th. Okay, today is my birthday. Yes, today is my birthday because I received Jesus Christ in December 12th, 1996. And it just happens that I just remember. Thank you, Jesus. I'm getting younger. <clears throat> but I remember um, not even wanting to go to church. I remember someone had invited me, and I, I liked the vibe because I didn't grow up in, you know, in religion. So I, I just like vibes. You know, you're looking for vibes. And I remember going into the church, and I was like, okay, I can feel the vibe here. I was the only Hispanic, so I didn't know if the vibe was well or not. But I can feel the love that night. And I remember that my husband took me to the church, and we both walked in. And it was a Friday night, and uh, I couldn't even hear the message. I was just so in awe that I can feel something, that my heart was open. And then at the end of the service, when they said, who would like to receive Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior? I didn't even know what that meant. But, hey, I thought, if Jesus is what I'm feeling right now, I want him. And I remember that my husband and I were raised our hands and well he was the first one so I'm like I need to do it then you know like okay so we both walked and and I remember that our lives have never been the same and I need, I need to tell you that our lives have never been the same we've been through the valleys through the uh, mountain tops we've been through heavy things but I, I can tell you that honestly God has never ever ever left us ever left us you know, maybe in the moment when you're going through something, you think that he left you. Maybe when you're going through something really hard, you think, you know what? He abandoned me. I'm going to tell you that God never lies. And Jesus is so amazing and he loves you. And I believe that tonight I'm asking you to open your heart. Open your heart and open your mind and just receive his love. I believe that tonight if you came and you're a little bit hopeless, maybe you're literally hopeless there's not even a little bit of hope or you can have a little bit of hope and maybe some of you are in great faith but i believe that at the end of the service i believe that if you're in great faith you're going to be in greatest faith and if you were a little bit hopeless you're going to be full of hope because you're going to realize who you are who you are and what god wants you to hear this message okay so are we there so, because I want to talk about the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? We've been talking about Jesus, and, and you know, I'm going to tell you a little joke. I don't know how to tell jokes, but this is real. <clears throat> it is a real story. It's my joke, so you can laugh about me. Uh, I remember when I, I'm already going on a tangent, but I remember when I, I was so desperate, I just received Jesus, right? And, I, and, and then whenever a church was open, I just needed, I needed, I needed him. And so I needed to be in a church. And at the time, they only had uh, one service on a weekday and Sundays. And I worked Sunday, so I couldn't go. So I'm like, uh, and I couldn't go on a Friday because I was working as well. So I thought, hey, I'm going to go downtown. And I'm just going to go find. In, in downtown LA, there's crazy churches, let me tell you. But I went and I didn't care. I took the bus because I didn't know how to drive because I was so full of fear. I, I, I was gripped with fear. So I took the bus and I remember taking my baby, Alexis, and we both went. And then I was like, okay, how do I find a church? You know, remember, in those times, there's no Google. There's no, like, it was beepers, you know, like, that's it. 
that's it, right? I mean, you have, have to go to the library. Uh, so anyway, so I just went and I said, whatever, I'm just going to go enter. And then, true story. And then they said, if you need help, call Jesus. And I was like, ah, that's what I need. But I didn't read the, the, the next part. So they give the number and I'm like trying to find, find a pay phone. But it was to repair a refrigerator. So it was fine, Jesus, you know, like you're in LA. So I never told this story because I was so embarrassed. But now since it's my birthday, you know what? I decided just to tell, I was like, that's the number. And I didn't even have coins. And I'm like, okay, I need to call Jesus. Because I'm now thinking Jesus, right? He says, if you need help, you know, call Jesus to fix your refrigerator. And I was excited. I was like, well, he fixes everything. So, but then I realized that, no, it wasn't that. But I did find the church online. But it was just a side. See, I already went there. But anyways, John 3, 16. And 17 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Do you know that Jesus, right now, you and I are the arms of Jesus. You and I are the voice of Jesus. We represent his kingdom. We represent his love. We represent his compassion. And I'm going to tell you that Jesus right now, he's not condemning anyone. He's not, I don't know where you've been, but I'm going to tell you that he is not condemning you. I'm going to tell you that he's not shaming you. And a friend of mine, I was talking to a friend of mine, and I said, what is it that the enemy always comes and attacks us with shame? Have you ever been ashamed of something that took place in your life? It maybe wasn't even your fault, but you feel shame. This shame comes to eat you. Maybe I should have been a better parent. Maybe I should have been a better friend, a better spouse, a better leader, a better pastor, and you name it, a better, you know, boss, a better, whatever you want to say. And then we want to be better. And then we want to represent a God who is not even concerned about our shame because he took the shame upon himself on the cross. So do you know that every time you and I feel shame, do you know that that's not from heaven? And you need to know that that is not from heaven. That is not God. If you ever feel guilty, do you know that even guiltiness is not from heaven? He will convict you because he wants you to be transformed. But he's never going to guilt you. He's never going to shame you because shame is never going to change anyone. Have you ever met someone that was changed by shamed? If someone shames me, oh, it's on. It's like this other person comes out like, oh, really? You don't even, even if they're right, you're like, okay, just because you said it, I'm not going to do it. And see, God knows who we are. God knows our essence. He knows. You know, I was reading, I love to read it. So I was reading this book, and I'm sure you heard about Dr. Caroline Leaf, and she says that we, our body, our brain, we are wired for love. She says that our default literally is love. That's our default. That's our default. It's in our DNA that God gave us. Our default is love. Fear we learn. And so we live with this fear and we live with this shame. But one of the things that I want to tell you tonight, that shame has never changed anyone. Change, shame has never transformed anyone. And the only antidote, the only thing that kills shame is compassion. Compassion. So I want to talk to you about that compassion of Jesus Christ. I want to talk to you about the gospel of good news. Because we know about the gospel, right? When we think about the gospel, we say, well, Mark, Mark, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, you know, you, we can quote them, right? And then we say that everybody had their own. Um, do you read? When I became a Christian, I was so confused because I read Matthew, and then but Mark said something else, and, and then Luke said another thing, and, and John, who thought he was the best, right? But, but the reality is that they were given their own accounts and their experiences that they have with Jesus. And, and, and it is beautiful. And when you read it, all you read in the Gospels, it's in the Gospel, all you read is about love, grace, and friendship. That's all you read about Jesus. He was so out of the box. He was so loving. 
He was just an amazing, and he was, he became, he, be, he came to this world as a human being. Sometimes, I mean, I used to read the Bible, and sometimes I still read the Bible, and I said, well, of course, it's Jesus, you know. He came, and, and he's God. Yeah, he's God, and yet he came in a form of a man, and he felt everything because he needed to feel everything. He felt shame. He felt pain. He felt disappointment. He felt betrayal. He felt everything, and yet she chose, he chose to stay in alignment with the Father. And sometimes as Christians, when we hit those places, we choose to default because we think, you know what, my default is evil. No, according to the word of God and according to science, this is according to science, I am wired for love. So when I want to hate people, I want to remember myself, you know what, Virginia, you are wired for love. Because I have Jesus' DNA. I became a new creation. You became a new creation when you received Jesus. And so when we think about the gospel, many times we think about, yeah, it's a gospel. It's about like wrong and right, right? Morality and, uh, you know, holiness and, and, you know, change behavior and uh, not cursing, reading the Bible. And those are part of the gospels. But the most important part of it is grace and love and the truth of God. Because we can get caught up in everything that is sinful. And I think that's what churches are, are, like I said, I don't know if you already said that, but every, and I'm sure now statistics are going higher, but every, every year, 11,000 churches are opening, but 7,000 churches are closing. And we think we are advancing the kingdom, right? Well, well we opened 11,000 churches. And this is just here, and this is like, Statistics from back in the day, so I don't know what, what the new stats are, but if we're open 11,000 churches, but 7,000 7, are closing, you tell me, are we advancing the kingdom? Maybe we forgot. Maybe we forgot where God found us when he chose us. You know, this year for me has been a very year, a year of discovery. This year for me has been a year of a lot of uh, receiving a lot of his grace. I can honestly tell you that this year out of all the years, I know how God is so loving. That God, when he chooses you, he doesn't make mistakes. When he chose you, he knows everything about you. Every detail of your life, he knows it. Let me update his, his, his stats for, for me. I just pulled the hair. He has a count of every hair that we have, and I still kill and put it off. I have good hair. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> That's God. You know, as you're getting younger, you want your hair, right? <clears throat> but then I thought, God, you're so detailed. You're so detailed. You care about us, about us in every single way. And sometimes we think God chose us, so God gave us, gave you a purpose, gave you a calling. It's because when you were in your mountaintop, when you felt like, ah. you know, have you ever felt when you were, you were just gliding? Have you ever been in those moments with God and your family and life and work and, and finances and friends? You, you feel just like you're gliding. There were times in my life that I felt like, oh my gosh, this is, this is the best. I sound like Nacho Libre. <laughs> the best you know like I was like this is awesome it's wonderful and then then you at that moment because everything is good you think no wonder God chose me you know that God chose me my kids are obeying me they're you know they're doing great you know my husband is doing good we're doing good the church is doing good and then you just look at the external things and everything is awesome so you're like yay we made it looks like we made it I sing songs on Wednesday if you don't come <clears throat> and then all of a sudden things are not are not happening the way that you thought they were supposed to happen and then you question you question, did he really choose me? Did he make a mistake? Did he, really, did he really gave me a purpose? Am I the right person? And I'm going to tell you, yes, you are the right person. Yes, you have the same purpose. He doesn't change. Thank God he doesn't change. We are required to change, but he doesn't change. 
So he never changes his purpose, his destination. It never changes. It never changes because he never changes. So I'm here to tell you that God wants you to believe that you are tonight in the right place at the right time and with the right people. And I believe that God will speak to you and you will know today how much he loves you. I know the end of the year is almost over, but hey, we still have a couple of days, a couple of weeks when you and I can make some changes in our lives, the way that we view Jesus, the way that we view your life, the way that we view our family. So whatever you're going through, this is the time, this is the moment. We don't have to wait until the end of the year. We don't have to wait until you do all your goals. No, this is the time. And I believe that I hear God saying, this is the time if you just believe me. Because he wants to bless you. Let us go to John 15, 15. Do you know that Jesus will, will, uh, will tell you to come as you are? Do you know that those, those seats are empty because people think that they have to get their crap together to come to church? Yes, we do say crap in the church. No, it's not my accent. If I knew how to spell it, I would not. <laughs> but I believe that a lot of our seats are empty because people think that, I used to think that, that you need to have your life together. Before I go to church, I need to change. Before I go to church, there has to be something that, that's happening. And I don't know how to change it, but I would like to be in church, but I don't know. And because sometimes you and I are not great representatives. We're not great ambassadors for Jesus Christ because all we focus is on the sin that people are living in. People are coming in droves and they're, and they're hopeless. And sometimes what I found out is that many times we have more compassion with people that are sick in body than people that are sick in their soul. We go visit people that are, that are hospitalized, we've, we take the meals, but if someone's going through depression, girl, you better get it together. Or somebody's going through uh, a problem and, and, and they don't know how to get out of it because they're stuck, there's no compassion. But I'm going to tell you that the world and the church is sick and is broken, not just a physical illness, but Many are brokenhearted. Many souls are just so confused. And they're searching for answers. And you and I are the answer. But what happened is we have departed from compassion. And I was just like, all I need to do is read my Bible. And I'm not saying that you do that. But many of us, that's what we think. You know, I'm just going to read my Bible. I'm just going to do, I'm going to do my quota. I'm going to do what check, checklist, right? It's not Santa. We, we serve Jesus. Santa checks his list twice. Jesus doesn't because he doesn't keep a list on your sins. Isn't it something? He's not recording. Oh, my gosh. Mary Virginia did it again. Oops, she did it again. <laughs> hey, my husband's not here. We're praying for him, right? <laughs> yes, babe, you study. Um, but this is what Jesus says. Jesus says, I have never called you servants. Because a master doesn't confide in his servants, and servants don't always understand what the master is doing. But I call you my most intimate friends. But I reveal to you everything, for I reveal to you everything that I've heard from my father. Jesus calls us friends not because of who you are or what you have done, but because of who he is. See, we called each other friends, right? Like, I mean, I remember when I came to the Lord, I used to pray for friends because I was very unfriendly. Well, I, it's not that I was very unfriendly. I just didn't know how to be a friend. I'm, I, I believe that I'm still learning how to be a friend. I think the more we abide in Jesus, the more we know Jesus, the better friend we become. Um, because he's a friend to all people, to saved ones and unsaved ones, because he came for the world and he loves his bride, right, which is the body of Christ. So, but I remember I used to pray to, you know, I was in church, and this is in my beginning, right, 22 years. So remember, I, I, I used to pray, Father, you know, I, I need friends, you know, like, as I heard it, I heard it in the church, you need to have friendships, you need to find people that think like you think, and, and, I, and every time I would, 
uh, people will come to me and they will be like, hey, do you want to go, go have coffee? And like, I can't. You know, I, I just can't. I'm like, I have a little three-year-old, you know, and she, I don't have a babysitter. You can bring her. No, she's very selective. I used to say that about Alexis. I think that's what she was selective. Where is she? I don't know if she's over there, right? But I was like, oh, she's very selective. And she was very like, you know, because she, she used to rule the house. Parents, that's another story. She used to rule the house. So she will cry, and I need to be like paying attention to her. And I'm like, oh, no, it's because she's, she's not going to let me talk. So the whole year, she, I always said it was Alexis. Forgive me, I was lying in church. And so, and then I, one day I remember crying out to God, and I said, I've been praying, God. I've been asking you for friendships. And I said, and you don't even listen. You don't even care. And he said, I have sent you every person. I send you every person that wants to meet you, but you said no. It's your choice. All these people just want to love you. And then that's when I started, and I, and I, I need to realize, you know, Lord, I don't know how to be a friend. I don't, know, I, I don't know how to do that, so would you teach me? And I said, because you are a friend. You call us a friend. And so if you teach me, I will grab at least one or two, and I will learn how to be a friend. But I'm going to tell you that that's a lifestyle. And think about it. When Jesus chose all his disciples, who did he choose? You know, we have become very critical. The body of Christ has become very critical. I have become, there have been seasons in my life that have become very critical. And I think about when Jesus met, and let us go there, because my time is coming. When I hear, you know, the music, that means let's close it. Matthew 9, let's go to Matthew 9. And start in verse 19, 9 to 13. And it's about Matthew, that how Jesus chose Matthew. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at his tax collector's booth. Follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. So Matthew got up and followed him. Later, Matthew invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guest, along with many tax collectors and other just what? Disreputable sinners. They were not reputable. But when the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does this teacher eat with such scum? When Jesus read this, he, I mean, heard this, he said, healthy people don't need a doctor. Six people do. Then he added, now go and learn the meaning of this scripture. I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. For have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but to those who know that they are sinners. The same verse in another translation, verse 9. I'm going to read it to you because I love how it reads it. It says, as Jesus left Capernaum, he came upon a tax collecting station where a treacherous Jew was busy at his work collecting taxes for the Romans. His name was Matthew. Come follow me, Jesus said. So immediately Matthew jumped up and began to follow Jesus. I love what this says because it says that he was a treacherous man. Or traitorous man, whatever how you pronounce it. But you know what that means? It means that you, when you study that, when he chose it, it means that he was disloyal. I mean, Jesus went up to him and he says, hey, I know what you do. You're a gangster. You belong to the gang MS or whatever, the worst gangs or whatever. I don't, I'm okay, let's get that there. Or whatever gangs, right? He was passing to the station, and then you have to pay. I mean, he was working. He was a wannabe Roman. And he was, he was stealing from the people. And he knew it. He knew it because he knows all things. He knew that he was disloyal, false, untrue, adulterous, a traitor. That's, that's what it means. Deliberately faithless, treacherous, deceitful, to timing, and the list goes on and on. So Matthew was the epitome of evil. And you would think, why would Jesus, why would Jesus choose him? And then you question your calling, like, you're like, I'm not traitorous. I'm not, like, too timing. I'm not this. I'm not faithless. Okay, then we have hope. But he chose them at his words. It was at his worst time that Jesus chose him. And so what I'm trying to tell you tonight is that many times we become blinded. And we allow life. I mean, life is difficult. Life is not easy. 
but we need to choose every day. We need to choose the gospel of good news. We need to know who Jesus is and what he has done in our lives. I am able to say that I am good and I am righteous. I can say that, you know that, that you can say that if you have Jesus, you can say, I am good. Alone, I'm not good, but with Jesus, I am. I can say I am a righteous woman of God. Ask my husband. He'll be like, no, she's not. No. Hey, with Jesus, I am. No, but the point is like, people can say all things about you. And sometimes we get so caught up with what everyone is saying and what they think of us and, and everything that we've done and what we're going through. And then we forget. We truly forget who we are. We truly forget that you can say, no, you know what? I am the righteousness of Jesus Christ. I am the hope. I am the hope of my family. I am the hope of my friends. I am the hope wherever I go, I carry hope. And you might, that morning, you probably feel hopeless. You feel like crap. But you really, literally, you are the hope. You really are the hope. You can't change the fact because he, hope resides in us. The Holy Spirit resides inside of us. So we are able, you and I are able to not only change ourselves with the help of the Holy Spirit and change our lives so we don't repeat 2018 doesn't go into 2019. You and I have the capacity, the ability, the power to change what's coming in 2019. I mean, I wish God would come and do it all. And I was thinking, and I was asking God, like, oh, my gosh, Lord, if you are so in, you know, in control, you know, he's not in control. He's in charge. God is in charge. You're in control. He left us here. And he says, you know what? I'm going to prepare mansions for you. I'm going back to my father. So I am in charge because I'm your boss. I am your, you know, I'm the head. But you are in control on this earth. We can't control our circumstances. We can't control things that we cannot control. We're always trying to control things that we are out of our range. But we could control what we're going to do, how we're going to respond, how we're going to love, how we're going to give grace, how we're going to give mercy. And I, I close in with this. John 11. Let's go to John 11. Quick, quick, quickly. No, I'm sorry, John. Did I say 11? You guys are not even listening. John 8, 1 to 11. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. And early in the morning, he came again into the temple. And all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. Then he, the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. First of all, I'm like, if they caught her in the very act, I'm like, they're peeping tongues. What are they doing? We caught her. Like, it was a multitude in the very act. So that means, like, you were watching for a while? But that's okay, right? Think about it. Go with me. Let's go with my mind. Now, Moses in the law commanded us to, to such uh, should be stoned. But what do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger, as though he did not hear. See, maybe you, you, your past, maybe people, maybe your own self, you accuse yourself constantly because we're very hard with ourselves. And you know that Jesus doesn't even pay attention to all the accusations. He says... He went down, stood down as he did not hear it. He wasn't moved. And this is so when they continue asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone. And the woman standing in the midst, when Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. You go and sin no more. See, the gospel of Jesus Christ is not a doctrine. It's not a religion. 
thing. It's not just religion. Because I was in the law. They were caught up. We saw her. She needs to die. This is what Moses says. And Jesus was like, I didn't come to condemn anyone. I came to save. His message, I believe that his life, has, his life was his message and his message gave life. That's the gospel. I'm going to ask you, how's your life? What message are you giving? And is your message giving life? Or are we condemning people? Are we... Are we crucifying people daily? We're good at stoning people. Do you got a stone, right? Today, they give you a stone? Tell me if you don't have one. Who doesn't have one? Can we give a stone to the people that don't have one? Because I brought my own stones. If I can open this box. I mean, this... Thank you, sir. Grab your stone. They need... Um... Oh, there's a lot of people without stones. See, I share my stones. Anyone else? Okay, so Jesus said that he came to save the lost. God said, I sent my son to die, but I sent my son to save the world, not to condemn the world. So why is it okay that we condemn each other? You, you have your own stone. You know, stones represent, in that, in that portion, represent our sins. Like, what's keeping you? What, what's keeping you? What stone? I'm just giving you one because they were too expensive, you know what I mean? But you can buy your own stones. Just kidding. They're so cute. But what's keeping you? What's tripping you? I'm going to be honest with you. I always call it like, I, I, when I started church here, I, I wanted to do a, um, that's when we were very conservative, right? Um, at the beginning, I wanted to call um, uh, a series, The Stoners, right? <laughs> but then people would think like, you know, we're here like, right? <clears throat> and I was like, no, no. At that time we were like, no, no. I was like, why? But we're stoners, you know? Yeah, like, go to the stoners church, right? No, I said, we don't want to be stoners. I just want to talk about the stoners, how we can become stoners without, you know. But anyways, the, it, the, the explanation was too long, so we got it. But, but then I, I was thinking, the Lord, I said, thank you that I'm not a stoner, you know. I, I have kept my heart right, you know. And, and as I was thinking about that woman, I thought, how many things have tripped me? in my walk with the Lord because people have accused you maybe you did something maybe you were in sin or maybe it was gossiping have you ever felt the rocks when people just stone you and just and if you let it do you know that Jesus will take your place when you're being stoned if you let him but there's sometimes we don't let him because we forget who he is. We forget that even the woman that was caught in adultery, he said, you know what? Woman, I don't condemn you. So just, you know what? Get up, go and sin no more. Do, don't do it anymore. Just follow me. And I was preparing for my message. I was just, you know, I thought, my gosh, we need to, we need to repent. How many times have we stoned people? I feel like in church, this is what we do. I wish this was like... But this is what we do. Like, people are coming. And it's like, we're like crazy stoners. He's not changing enough. Oh, my God. Did I break that? <laughs> and they think they're Christians. They don't even read their Bible. Don't say if it broke, you didn't see it. But 
I, that's what I picture when I was writing this message, how crazy we can be, how we can be so lost and we lose our purpose of who Jesus is. And why we do what we do, why we have like people think we're crazy because we have six services. No, we're not crazy. It's because we want to stop the stoning. And so people even, we even do this to ourselves. We cut ourselves because of what happened to us, of what someone said to us. And you know, as I was meditating on this, I, the Lord said to me, Virginia, remember when you said that you were going to keep your heart right? And then all of a sudden I was like, it was like I could see a movie and I can see all these people stoning me and everything that people have said. And, and like, oh my gosh, so I was like, I was so happy when I was in a, a pastor. And I wasn't like happy like that, but you know. But then I thought like, no one talked about me and my life was in public and you know, why I didn't live in a fishbowl. But I thought, how many times have people said such lies about my family and they stole me and I let them because I didn't trust in Jesus. And I let them hurt me like. How many times did I just, people just said things and gossip and, and other people just listened to them and they came and told me and I, I, was, I was thinking that I was, my heart was right. But then again, I was being stoned. And it wasn't the people that were stoning me. It's because I was allowing it to happen. I can't stop what people are going to say about me, about my family, about the church, about our leaders, our pastors, our church. But I can, I am in control of myself. I am in control of my love meter, of my compassion, that I never walk away from compassion, that I never walk away from the body of Christ, that I never walk away from people because Jesus died for people that were broken. And I thought, it's time to put your stones down. Your own stones that we carry. And like, I thought, hey, you know, I don't have, I don't carry any stones. But then I realized, you know, I do carry a lot of them. And this is what the Lord said to me. And this is what we're going to do. I don't know what's tripping you. I don't know what has hurt you. I know what you've done. But I'm going to tell you that God forgives you. And he tells you tonight, I do not condemn you. I do not condemn you. I'm not here condemning you. I'm here loving you. Just follow me and sin no more. Because the more we follow him, the more I look like the grace of God, the more I'm defined by the grace of God, the more I follow Jesus, that's when I'm being transformed. If today's message impacted you in any way, and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below, and we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.